Hello, here we're going to be covering a few clinical cases for the axial skeleton. So let's get started. In this module, we will be covering five clinical cases. The first three have to do with the abnormal curvature of the vertebral column, which are scoliosis, hyperkyphosis, and hyperlordosis. And the last two have to do with abnormalities that have nothing to do with the normal curvature, which are the spina bifida and the herniated disc. So we can understand the abnormal vertebral column curvature. We first need to understand the normal curves of the vertebral column. When viewed from an interior or posterior, a normal adult vertebral column, it will appear straight. But when viewed from the side, it shows four slight bends that are called normal curves. Relative to the front of the body, the cervical and the lumbar curves are convex, which means that they will be bulging out. And the thoracic and the sacral curves are concave, which means that they're going to be cupping in. And the curves of the vertebral column, they will increase its strength. They will also help to maintain the balance in the upright position. They will absorb shocks during walking, and they also help to protect the vertebrae from fracture. Now the cervical and the lumbar curvatures, besides being convex, they will receive the name of lordosis. And the thoracic and the sacral, besides being concave, they are also called kyphosis. The way that I remember this is that lumbar starts with L and lordosis starts with L. And I know that they alternate. So you're going to have a cervical as lordosis, then you skip one, and the lumbar as lordosis. Then you're going to have the thoracic as a kyphosis, you skip one, and the sacral will also be a kyphosis. And the way that I remember that convex is the one that sticks out, is that the EX reminds me of exterior, and therefore it's the one that will stick out, so it will bulge in the interior direction. And the kyphosis will go in, so it will bulge in the posterior direction. In the fetus, as we see here on the left image, there is only a single anteriorly concave curve throughout the length of the entire vertebral column. At about the third month after birth, that's when the infant starts to hold their head erect, an interiorly convex cervical curve will begin to develop. And later when the child starts to sit up and stand and walk, that's when you're gonna have an interiorly convex lumbar curve begin to develop. And the thoracic and the sacral curves which are called primary curves because they retain the original curvature of the embryonic vertebral column. So the cervical and the lumbar curves are known as a secondary curves because they begin to form later on in life and several months after birth. But all curves are going to be fully developed by age 10. However, the secondary curves, they may be progressively lost as you get into old age. With regards to the abnormal curves of the vertebral column, there are three types. First, we have the scoliosis, which as you can see, it's going to be this abnormal lateral curvature of the spine, and it usually affects adolescent girls. Then we have the abnormal curves that will affect the kyphosis and the lordosis. But because they are going to be exaggerated curves, then I like to add the word hyper in front because this will differentiate from a normal curvature to an abnormal curvature. So hyper means greater. And as you can see here on the hyperkyphosis, it's going to be a greater curvature, concave curvature of the thoracic part. So you can see right over here, the thoracic part is more indented. The hyperlordosis, again, is an abnormal curvature of the lumbar region, and this means that you're going to have an accentuation 
of the convex curvature in the lumbar region. Usually this occurs in pregnant women because they have to balance out the weight of the belly. In the spina bifida, basically this means that it's a failure of the narrow tube to close in the more caudal regions. There are three different types as we can see here, the occulta, the meningocele, and the myelomeningocele. In occulta, this defect is going to be restricted to the vertebral arches and it's usually asymptomatic. From this image, we can see that it's going to frequently manifest externally only by a small dimple or even a small tuft of hair on the lower back as seen here on the image. In meningocele, this condition features a more extensive bony and soft tissue defect that will permit the protrusion of the meninges. So you can see how the meninges will come out through this opening and it's going to form this fluid filled sac that it's going to be visible on the external surface of the back at the midline because that's where the vertebral column is going to be located. Lastly, we have the myelomeningocele and this term is going to refer to a more extensive defect that will expose the spinal canal and also cause nerve roots and spinal cord to be entrapped in this externally visible protruding CSF filled sac. Usually the spinal cord is going to be flattened or ribbon-like structure as we can see here on this image and as you can imagine it will cause severe neurological consequences that can include things like a lower extremity motor or sensory defect. It can compromise the bowel and bladder functions. It's very severe compared to the others. Lastly, we have the herniated disc, which occurs when all or part of the disc is going to be forced through this weakened part of the disc and this may place pressure on the nearby nerves as we can see right over here or even on the spinal cord. The disc may move out of place or it can break open from an injury or even a strain and when this happens there may be a pressure of the spinal nerves and this can lead to a lot of pain, numbness and even weakness and it's really hard for you to get it back to place. You have to rest for a prolonged period of time depending on the injury of the herniated disc. But from this image here, we can see how the nerves are going to be affected because there's a bulging of the herniated disc. And sometimes the patient needs to undergo surgery to remove the herniated disc.